thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, truly an honor to be here and a, a pleasure to be in uh, Korea. Um, so we're moving up the uh, periodic table, slowly but surely, and we've reached helium. Um, and I'm going to tell you about helium films at ultra-low temperatures. Uh, these temperatures are reached using... Um, point doesn't seem to be functioning. So on Seems to be some technology issue here for me. Okay, I figured it out. Um, so these films uh, are cooled to uh, ultra low temperatures, um, 100 microkelvin, using uh, this kind of apparatus. It takes us about a week to get there, unlike the cold atoms community. Uh, the themes of the talk are going to be uh, emergent, strongly correlated quantum states. Um, Helium films seem to be a highly tunable model system for condensed matter physics. I'm going to talk about uh, a bottom-up and top-down approach to the study of helium films, and other themes are layered, in, layered structures, interfaces, and mesoscopics. Okay, so... Um, excuse me. This is a non-intuitive pointer for me. Um, so we have two atoms. Uh, helium-3 is a fermion, and helium-4 is a boson. And the topics of interest are Landau Fermi liquids in two dimensions, the possibility of BCS superfluidity in a two dimensional Fermi liquid, uh, a Hubbard transition from a Fermi liquid into a quantum spin liquid, frustrated magnetism in general, heavy fermion physics, mesoscopic transport. And in the case of helium 4 films, I'm going to talk a little bit about evidence of a new quantum state with intertwined superfluid and density wave order, a form of supersolid and in the top-down case, to talk about helium-3 confined in regular nanofabricated geometries. <clears throat> so, bottom-up. Um, here, we're going to deposit um, helium on the surface of graphite. Uh, graphite is atomically flat, and this is the absorption potential of a helium-3 atom on the surface of graphite. You can see it's extremely deep. This is the ground state. There's a binding energy of about 150 Kelvin. Helium-4 is more massive, so when you solve the Schrodinger equation here, you get um, the fact that the helium-4 atoms are more strongly bound. <clears throat> the point is, then, because of this atomic flatness and the fact that helium can be thought of as essentially as a hard sphere, the helium films grown on graphite are uh, atomically layered. So this is a cartoon of that. Here's the graphite surface, and here are two layers on the surface. The first helium layer solidifies. It forms a close-packed solid uh, on a triangular lattice. Um, and then the second layer atoms here are going to be subject to the periodic potential of the first layer atoms. And we can add further layers, up to about eight in total. Uh, the practicalities of this are the surface of graphite uh, uh, is, um, is atomically flat, but we need to have a relatively large surface area to do thermodynamic measurements. So to that end, we exfoliate the graphite substrate. Uh, so that's essentially exploding the uh, single crystal of graphite. Uh, it exposes the uh, graphite basal planes and we end up with a large surface area, about 20 square meters per gram. <clears throat> now, an important feature of this work is flexibility through pre-plating. The films are atomically layered, 
And helium-3, as we've just seen, has a lower binding energy to graphite because of its uh, higher mass. So that means we can pre-plate the surface, coat the surface, if you like, with something else. And that something else could be a solid monolayer of helium-4, a bilayer of helium-4, a solid bilayer of helium-4 with a superfluid helium-4 film, or a solid hydrogen bilayer, or other kinds of pre-platings. Every time we do this, then, we have a new effective surface, a new composite substrate. And the point about that is it gives us a high degree of tunability, because every composite substrate has a different binding potential, different characteristics, and so we can use that to model different physics. <clears throat> Now, just to get an idea about the top-down approach, um, here what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, a, a known material, um, superfluid helium-3. This is the phase diagram of superfluid helium-3. Pressure is a function of temperature. Helium remains liquid down to the absolute zero of temperature. And below a few millikelvin, there are two superfluid phases, the B phase and the A phase. Superfluid helium-3 is a beautiful model material. It's completely pure. It has a very simple spherical Fermi surface that preserves all these symmetries. It has an isotropic normal state, and there's no crystal lattice. And what we want to do is we want to take superfluid helium-3 and confine it into a cavity that's formed through this nanofluidic structure. And the typical height, D, is in the, that we've been studying is in this range. The length scale that characterizes the important range is the coherence length. If you like, you can think of that as the size of the Cooper pair at t equals zero is given by this set of parameters, which are functions of pressure. So this shows the coherence length goes from about 80 nanometers at zero pressure to about 20 nanometers at the, at the melting curve. So for a fixed cavity height, by tuning the pressure, we tune the effective confinement. At this stage, these thicknesses are very much larger than the effective inverse uh, Fermi wavelength which is essentially the interatomic spacing. So it's really only quasi two-dimensional. The interest of this is that superfluid helium-3 is a topological superfluid and can act as a model for um, topological superconductivity. There are these two phases which are completely different in character. The B phase is an isotropic gap. This is its order parameter. It's P-wave paired. This order parameter preserves uh, time reversal symmetry. And as a result, through um, a bulk edge uh, or surface correspondence, which is the characteristic uh, fingerprint of uh, topological quantum matter, the surface excitations on the B phase are Majorana fermions. They're helical. That means to say that the spin is locked to the momentum. <clears throat> on the other hand, the ABM phase, or A phase, that's in bulk is found up in this region of the phase diagram. Uh, has, uh, all, all the pairs have the uh, same orientation of, the, uh, ang of their angular momentum. So the gap has a node, and this phase is chiral. It breaks time reversal symmetry. <clears throat> and so the edge excitations then are Majorana vial fermions. So these excitations are at the surface, and these are at the edge. Um, so the way that we do this is brute force cooling. Uh, the technique is uh, we have a dilution refrigerator. Um, Harold referred to such a machine earlier. Uh, added to this is a nuclear adiabatic demagnetization stage. Uh, this material is copper. This is to achieve the temperatures down to 200 microkelvin. Um, we're doing experiments in thermal equilibrium. We measure the temperature using a variety of means. Uh, and we probe the system by various tools. Our spectroscopy is nuclear magnetic resonance on helium-3, which has spin one-half, and that allows us to selectively probe the magnetism of the helium-3 to measure its susceptibility in spin dynamics and to fingerprint the superfluid order. We can measure heat capacity, or we can do torsional oscillator me measurements to determine the superfluid density, which tells us about the elementary excitations in this system. And uh, the technical edge that we have is we spend a long time developing uh, the uses of squids to detect NMR signals, so-called squid NMR. Uh, and there are two varieties of this. And, they get the, and this technique gives us two things. It gives us a very high level of sensitivity to probe small samples. 
but it also enables us to work at extremely low frequencies, and both of those are advantageous, as hopefully you'll see. So now back to atomically layered helium films on preplated graphite, <clears throat> a little bit more about the preplating story and how different preplating give us access to different pieces of physics. So if we preplate with a monolayer of helium-4 or a bilayer of HD, and then we tune the density of this uh, helium-3 monolayer, the active monolayer, if you will, then this is the physics that we can probe. We can probe the, um, uh, the, the, the MOT transition. And we can also look at the magnetism of the MOT insulator, which we believe to be a quantum spin liquid. The laser point has just died, by the way. Um, we, if we preplate with a bilayer of solid helium-4, that we, we can tune the density of the helium-3 bilayer, and that, that gives us access to heavy fermion physics. And if we preplate pre -plate with a superfluid helium-4 film and tune the occupation of the helium-3 surface states, uh, then that's a coupled fermion boson system, and uh, we can study attractive propulsive interactions in such a Fermi system. <clears throat> uh, so a brief word then on correlated helium-3 fermions then, because I'm going to talk about things called Landau parameters, so just to remind you, uh, the standard model of correlated uh, fermion physics is Landau Fermi liquid theory. Um, so in an equation-free nutshell, it's this, uh, that the Fermi surface, which is a circle in two dimensions or a sphere in three dimensions, survives turning on the interactions the excitations are now uh, particle-like, but with a renormalized mass, so-called quasi-particles. Uh, these quasi-particles sit, obviously, at the Fermi surface, and they're weakly interacting. And the interactions between them are angular-dependent. It depends where the relative position on the Fermi surface. And perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the interactions are angular dependent, uh, so you can expand that angular dependence in the genre polynomials, uh, and you can also decompose it into spin symmetric and anti-symmetric components, and the coefficients of these terms then are the Landau parameters. The Landau parameters are determined experimentally from thermodynamic quantities or transport coefficients, and uh, the importance of them then is that they encode the interactions. Can you calculate them? Well, you can in the Fermi gas limit. And in some of the physics I'm going to be describing, we are trying to get into the Fermi gas limit, so they are in principle calculable. So about the mott hubbard transition then, uh, this is, we're, we're dealing with the second layer of helium-3 uh, on a helium-4 first layer on graphite. And this is the phase diagram and the thing to note here, this is temperature against the density of that layer. Now, if, you, if you're looking at correlations in bulk liquid, then you're stuck with the density of that liquid, which you can vary a little bit if you vary the pressure. But in this case, in two dimensions, you can vary, uh, the, the beauty of it is you can vary the density over an extremely wide range. And the thing that limits you is whether there is some self-condensed liquid uh, sitting around this corner. And recently, for this system, there's the proposal that, that this self-condensation density is about one atom per square nanometer. But nevertheless, that still gives you a wide range of density over which you can tune. And over here is uh, a solid phase that's believed to form in, uh, in commensuration with the, uh, the helium-4 underlayer. And the relative density of the helium second layer to the underlayer is, is four sevenths. So if we measure the heat capacity in this system as a function of, uh, of density, uh, this is the heat capacity, and, it, and the coefficient of, uh, of the linear dependence of the heat capacity at low temperatures tells you the effective mass. That's, it's governed by the density of states, which is proportional to the total area and the effective mass. So we can experimentally determine the effective mass, and you see this divergence in the effective mass. These, are, these data are for two first layers. The, the, this blue data is for uh, an HD bilayer uh, preplating, and that has a lower density uh, than 
at the helium-4 preplating, and therefore the divergence in the effective mass, which occurs at this 4 7 commensuration, occurs at a lower density. So this is evidence for a, a Mott Hubbard transition. Um, so the uh, Hamiltonian that we're, simplest Hamiltonian that we're simulating, if you will, is this one here. <coughs> Um, and uh, this has been treated uh, uh, in the Gutzwiller um, approximation to the Hubbard model by th these authors here some time ago. And what's found uh, in, in this case then is uh, that uh, if, if you have uh, an on-site repulsion in, in this model, what you're doing is you're tuning the on-site repulsion and at some critical value of the on-site repulsion you have a metal insulator transition and approaching that critical value uh, then the effective mass diverges. But the Landau parameter F naught A uh, tends to uh, a constant negative value of minus three quarters. And that's precisely what's observed in the system. So the conclusion from that is that helium-3 is an almost localized Fermi liquid, and what we're observing is the mott hubbard transition in this case. On the helium-4 first layer, the, the behavior is uh, slightly more complicated as we move through this region. Uh, so as we're going from the fluid in, uh, and, and approaching uh, the critical point where the mod insulator forms at this 4 7 coverage, and we uh, um, measure the total susceptibility of this system as we're going through some coexistence range, some quantum coexistence range where we have the sum of a fluid term plus a uh, solid term, we find that the solid fraction uh, varies continuously through this transition. It actually increases exponentially. And the effective mass uh, is also evolving continuously, ex extrapolating to infinity at the, uh, the Mott Hubbard um, uh, coverage. Um, so a full explanation of this, uh, of this, the continuous nature of this Mott uh, uh, transition is absent at the moment. Um, there's certainly no evidence in these experiments of a whole doped mod insulator. You expect at some density to form the mod insulator, and then at lower densities when you remove atoms to create vacancies or holes in that mod, mod insulator, and they will have a, full, a small Fermi surface, and then as you increase the number of uh, the hole doping, eventually you would expect to see a Fermi surface reconstruction. This is not observed in this, for this substrate. Um, so, uh, what we believe we have in this case is, is something more aligned with a Vigna Mott transition, and it's probably treated using an extended Hubbard model, but that, that's the subject of more work. So, the Mott insulator we believe to be a quantum spin liquid. Uh, a quantum spin liquid is as follows so, if you have spin one half on a, on a uh, um, triangular lattice, then this is the classic Niel ordered state. But in, in, in a spin liquid, what you, what, what, what you find is that there's no long-range order. Um, so, uh, and the excitations are, uh, the, these are uh, dimer pairs, spin up and spin down. And the excitation is uh, an isolated spin, uh, which can propagate through the, uh, the, the, dimer, the dimer structure. Um, one of the nicest uh, potential examples of this is uh, a triangular lattice that's based on this rather complicated compound that's been studied by the Kenoda group in Tokyo. And what we have here is something that's a lot simpler, I think. Um, so here are the helium-3 atoms on a triangular lattice. Each of them has spin one half. Uh, they can move around uh, by uh, atomic ring exchange. And the atomic ring exchange is described by permutation operators, and the permutation operators give you an effective spin-spin interaction. So uh, two-particle exchange uh, gives you a Heisenberg-like term. Three-particle exchange also gives you a Heisenberg-like term. But because of this minus one to the end, one's antiferromagnetic, and the other one is ferromagnetic. So the effective Heisenberg exchange is given by this combination. And that's frustrated by four spin exchange. <clears throat> so why might we expect to see a quantum spin liquid uh, in, in this case? So we have a highly frustrated system. It's frustrated both by the triangular uh, lattice geometry and by the competing ring exchange. 
And what's more, uh, this MOT insulating phase is occurring on the border of a MOT uh, insulator uh, transition, and that's believed to be favorable to the formation of a quantum spin liquid because you have large charge fluctuations in that case. So our evidence for this is from the low temperature susceptibility, uh, which is consistent with a Fermi liquid-like description. Uh, we can infer a characteristic temperature. And so we believe we have a smoking gun here for a spin on Fermi surface. And that would indicate that the system is a gapless quantum spin liquid. These are the predictions for a gapless quantum spin liquid. So yes, it has a Pauli-like susceptibility at low temperatures. And the interesting thing is that it's predicted that there will be this anomalous T to the two-thirds temperature dependence, which occurs because of the emerging gauge field in the quantum spin liquid system. And that's something that needs to be looked for. I'm going to, uh, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this and move on to um, another system. <clears throat> And this is the one where we believe that we can make the transition from the Fermi gas at extremely low densities to Fermi liquid. Um, and what we're doing here is uh, we have the graphite, and it's pre-plated by two solid layers of helium-4 and um, uh, two superfluid layers in this case. And we can vary the number of helium-4 layers. So we could look at one superfluid layer or two superfluid layers or more. Now, what happens when you add a helium-3 atom to this system? Um, the proposal is that it sits on the surface. So these are pictures of the surface states for uh, helium films of two thickness. So the density of the helium film is in red. This is for a thinner film. This is for a thicker film. And you can see oscillations in the density as a function of position from the surface. That just reflects the fact that the uh, film is atomically layered. And the ground state that you can see is at the surface of the film. And the first excited state, the one with a node, uh, has some part of it at the surface of the film and some part that penetrates the film. And the separation of the ground state and the first excited state is about a Kelvin. So that means at millikelvin temperatures, we can be confident of the, confident of the fact that, we're in, that the helium-3 is in the surface Andreyev bound state. This is a nice system because it's in the nature of things that a helium-4 film provides a clean equipotential surface. Otherwise, it, it flows over the surface. It's a superfluid in order to create that equipotential. Uh, there are no impurities or surface defects in this two-dimensional helium-3 system. And so we can study a single atomic layer of helium-3. We can vary its surface density. It's tunable over a wide range. And hence, we can span Fermi gas to Fermi liquid. The other degree of freedom is that we can adjust the helium-4 film thickness. And that's the number of superfluid layers. <clears throat> and this gives us the possibility of uh, tuning uh, the helium-3 helium interaction that's mediated by phonon or third sound modes. So this is a cartoon of that. So if you imagine a, a third sound mode, which is the surface excitation of the superfluid helium-4 film, then there's a tendency of the helium-3 atoms to uh, congregate in this minimum. Um, so uh, this means that the atoms are closer to the substrate. So you can see that the indirect um, interaction between the helium-3s that arises because of these surface excitations is strongly enhanced by the presence of the substrate. The thinner the film is, uh, the more energy is gained by these guys going into this minimum approaching closer to the substrate. And there are many related systems, both in the condensed matter community and the uh, quantum atoms, uh, cold atoms community, uh, particularly the Svealine group and the Curl group of uh, papers that I've been looking at of great interest. Um, so this is what we've done. Then uh, we measure the heat capacity as a function of temperature, and uh, we vary the coverage of the helium-3 film over a wide range. We measure the, the, the heat capacity that measures the effective density of states. And what we see is we see steps in the, uh, in the density of states. And those steps correspond to the uh, excitation of the higher uh, energy surface Andreyev bound states. 
So this is uh, the, the, the ground state, this is the first excited surface in drive bound state, and this is the uh, second excited state. So we're going from one to three Fermi systems. And as I said, the energy separation of the ground state and the first excited state, which is highly renormalized by the interactions within the film, uh, is about the Kelvin. Um, uh, so now uh, we've been boning up on uh, how interactions work in strictly 2D in the Fermi gas uh, limit by trying to understand uh, what the scattering length actually means, which is a slightly foreign concept if you've been working on helium-3. Um, so this is our understanding of that then. Uh, the first point I want to make is that, uh, as I said at the beginning, we're measuring interactions by determining these Landau parameters. This one comes from the specific heat. This one comes from the uh, magnetization. <clears throat> um, so 2D is very different from 3D. Uh, so here in red is the flashback resonance in, 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 in 3D. The scattering length in 2D is always positive. Um, there isn't a resonant effect, uh, and that resonant effect uh, occurs at, uh, that, that denotes uh, BCS BEC crossover. Uh, and it happens when the Fermi energy is equal to twice the uh, binding energy of uh, a helium 3 dimer. Uh, in 2D, the stability of dimers is a necessary condition for uh, S wave pairing, and dimers are always stable for purely uh, attractive interactions. And so you can use the dimer binding energy to uh, parameterize the interaction parameter. So the small parameter in 3D is KFA, where A is the scattering length. And in 2D, it can be written like this or written like this, where a uh, hash is a number which isn't actually uh, unity. Um, so that's responsible then for this uh, divergence at this point. And this is of interest because then uh, the prediction is that the, uh, the, the BCS gap, then on the BCS side, the gap takes this extremely simple form. It's given by the geometric mean of the Fermi energy and the uh, dimer binding energy. Um, but what we're interested in also is the fact that we may have helium-3 helium three interactions mediated by the superfluid helium-4 film uh, which are potentially attractive, uh, and those are living alongside the direct helium-3, helium-3 interactions, which are probably dominantly repulsive. So we're interested in understanding the crossover from, whoopsie daisy, uh, the crossover from repulsive to attractive interactions. So we can have a stab at this by using a super, pseudo potential uh, where you can vary the attractive part relative to the, the repulsive part and this is done here. So in the case where you've got a repulsive part to the potential, then there is a threshold to the attraction for the formation of dimers. <clears throat> so this point here where dimers become stable, is it very interesting? Uh, well, according to this, the, uh, the interaction parameter then goes to zero at that point. So that would say it's actually rather boring. But we believe that this treatment is probably too naive for the direct uh, versus helium-4 mediated uh, interactions competition that we're studying in the system for reasons I'll mention in a second. Um, so here are some measurements then. Uh, this is the effective mass as a function of density. Uh, and uh, the bottom line of this picture is that it agrees extremely well with Fermi gas theory. Uh, the effective mass is given by um, two parts then. There's the hydrodynamic part uh, due to the coupling between the single helium-3 atom and the helium-4 film. And this part here has got to do with the interactions between those helium-3s. And this describes the, the heat capacity extremely well. Uh, and now recently we've been able to measure using the squid NMR technique um, the Pauli susceptibility of this 2D uh, Fermi, Fermi system. And this is what the Pauli susceptibility tells us. So we've learned about F1S already from the effective mass. Uh, now we're going to learn about F0A. And what we're interested in is uh, uh, whether we can see a positive F0A. Because positive F0A means attraction in the singlet channel. So it's a it gives the hint that you may have uh, S-wave superfluidity. And you can see that for most of these coverages shown here, 
um, the, um, we have uh, a negative F0A. So that indicates repulsive interactions. There may be some evidence for positive F0A here. So the susceptibility here is divided by uh, chi sub zero, and that is the susceptibility of an ideal Fermi gas, which is independent in two dimensions of the surface density. So that's a nice way of normalizing uh, the data. So enhancements uh, of this quantity above one then are due to the hydrodynamic mass, which is about 1.3, and this combination of Landau Fermi liquid parameters. At lower densities in the range 0.3 to 1, uh, we, we see uh, a more complex evolution. So if we just focus on this plot, uh, let's take a cut here at low temperatures. So we're looking at the Pauli susceptibility enhancement as a function of coverage from the lowest temperature data. And we see that it goes up, and then it dips back down again, and then here it behaves in a regular way. Uh, so below one atom per square nanometer, something uh, interesting is happening, and this has to do with the, it must have to do with the coupling between the helium-3 and the underlying helium-4 film. So we could have, uh, and this is the advantage actually in this physics of having a uniform system to start off with, because then it enables you to look for uh, spatially inhomogeneous um, uh, emergent states. Uh, so here we have the possibility of lateral phase separation, a high-density surface layer, and maybe a low density of atoms buried inside the film. Uh, and the interesting thing uh, that was pointed out by this paper by Kurihara that I referred to earlier uh, is that um, as you tune uh, the helium-3 surface density, clearly you increase the upwards, clearly you increase the Fermi velocity and there's also an effect on the third sound velocity in the film. And so there's going to be a resonance when the two are equal to one another. So what does that resonant coupling give you? Kurihara suggests that there's a possible, possible feshback analog there. There are strong retardation effects in the helium-4 mediated interaction under that condition, and that requires a more complex uh, way of dealing theoretically with the interactions than the previous slide. So we're still hopeful that there may be some interesting physics at that crossover. Another thing I wanted to end here was saying that um, you can test models for Fermi liquid interactions by a parametric plot. This is one set of Landau parameters, F0A. This is F1S. And these, uh, in this parametric plot then, this curve here corresponds to the almost localized fermion model that I referred to earlier. And this is the Fermi gas model. Here we're getting out of the limit of the Fermi gas model, but nevertheless the data which agrees with Fermi gas here tends to be going over to the almost localized Fermi model. So why might that be? Well, so we measured the properties that the superfluidity of the helium-4 film with a torsional oscillator, which measures the superfluid density. And what we find is that the helium-3 kills the superfluidity of the helium-4. Uh, and this data is for a two-solid layer plus one superfluid layer. And if we're interested in uh, helium-3 in helium interactions mediated by a superfluid helium-4 film, then killing the superfluidity of that helium-4 film is not terribly useful. Um, so that tells us that we need to do a measurement on two solid layers plus two superfluid layers to avoid the suppression of the helium-4 superfluidity. Um, here we have, we're dominated by repulsive interactions, and uh, that imposes far more stringent conditions on the occurrence of superfluidity. You could get P wave superfluidity, uh, but uh, the search for those conditions continues. So now I want to change gear and talk about uh, um, a novel bosonic quasi condensation in two dimensional helium 4. Uh, so here's graphite, um, and here are two layers of helium-4. And the active, this, this first layer is a compressed solid, and the active layer is the second layer, and we're going to tune the density of that second, second layer. And we're going to measure the response using a torsional oscillator. So that's to detect superfluidity. And we find that there's superfluidity over a narrow range of film, dens uh, uh, film densities, which has a highly anomalous temperature dependence. And there's no finite temperature costlet salis transition. So to explain this data, which I'll show you in a second, we make an ansatz for the excitation spectrum, which reflects density wave order. 
to account for this temperature dependence, we make an ansatz for the quasi-condensate that's consistent with that spectrum, and uh, that breaks both gauge symmetry and translational symmetry. And this state, then, uh, is a, a quantum state with intertwined superfluid and density wave order. And if I was reckless, I would call that a two-dimensional supersolid. Uh, so this is what we do. Uh, this is the frequency shift as a function of temperature for a series of helium-4 coverages. Uh, so this red vertical line there is the completion of the second layer. So all of this action is occurring towards the end of the second layer. And you see that the superfluid response turns on and then it turns off again. Uh, we can take the data and we can scale it according to this formula. So everything is scaled by a single energy uh, parameter and the data collapses onto one curve in region one and another curve in region two. So we have two kinds of scaling. And the characteristic energy scale as a function of coverage then has this behavior. So in regime two, uh, it's linear and it's dying at this point, which we identify as a quantum critical point. In the low temperature limit, uh, the superfluid density is linear in temperature, and that's extremely unusual, not what you expect for two-dimensional phonons. Um, and so um, uh, in order to do that, then what we, uh, to explain that peculiar temperature dependence, then we invoke uh, this uh, proposed excitation spectrum and use the Landau uh, prescription um, to calculate the superfluid density. And the key thing here is that there's a small uh, roton-like but extremely small gap at a set of six reciprocal lattice vectors of a putative density wave ordered phase. <clears throat> um, so uh, we propose such a quasi-condensate uh, uh, which has uh, a condensate both at zero momentum and finite momenta of the reciprocal lattice vectors. This is that quasi-condensate in which superfluid and density wave order are intertwined. <clears throat> what we know is that we have uh, a superfluid. Um, what we believe is that we have a density wave. Uh, given that this, you can write the density operator like this, then in the presence of a superfluid condensate, then uh, th these equations apply. Um, and the bottom line here is, is that uh, in the presence of uh, a superfluid condensate with density wave order, this necessarily implies that there's a condensate at finite Q. And that justifies this wave function. Um, so in the case of condensation both in zero momentum and at a, and at a single finite momentum, then uh, this would be the uh, ansatz for the, uh, uh, the, the wave function, and the condensate can be visualized in this block sphere. And now the idea is that the state vector can live anywhere on this block sphere, and so the state is non-abelian because three-dimensional rotations don't commute. And in that case, vortices will not be stable, and so we have a... Um, um, absence of a coslet cell in its transition. So within the, uh, the, the framework of this hypothesized uh, condensate, then we can account for the low temperature behavior of the superfluid density, the absence of a BKT transition. Uh, and so this is, um, uh, I think, uh, the discovery of the two-dimensional supersolid. Um, so now I think... Um, I just want to say a few words on the top-down approach. Um, so this is about confining superfluid helium-3 into... Uh, uh, these uh, slab-like geome geometries. So we have a thin superfluid film. Uh, it's P-wave. We can fix the thickness by the cavity height. Uh, because the coherence length, the size of the pairs, uh, is pressure dependent, we can vary the effective confinement. We've developed these sensitive NMR tools then to determine the order parameter. <clears throat> and so we've looked at a slew of different sized uh, cavities. <clears throat> 
like I said at the beginning, we are still in the, uh, the quasi uh, 2D, 2D limit. Um, so maybe it's of interest to this audience to ask the question, well, how do we do better? How do we approach the stronger uh, quasi 2D limit? Um, so the question is, what's the order parameter as we narrow the cavity height, as we glow, go below 100 nanometers? Uh, we're going to gradually expect to see more effects of size quantization in the normal state. That means that the spherical Fermi surface is going to be broken up into Fermi disks. Um, this is the A phase. Uh, if, if, if the Fermi surface is no longer a sphere but disks, then this node can't exist. Uh, and so, uh, in quasi two dimensions, the A phase is gapless, which is interesting. Uh, but to have a superfluid at cavity heights uh, less than the coherence length, you need to have specular surfaces. So, what do I mean by that? Uh, the suppression of the order parameter uh, deter is determined by the, the, the surface scattering of quasi particles. Um, what this shows then is uh, that if you have, uh, that there are components, it's a question of what the orbital angular momentum of the of, uh, of components of the pair are. Uh, those components uh, where the orbital angular momentum is normal to the surface are not suppressed. Uh, and those components where the orbital angular momentum vector lies in the surface are suppressed. <clears throat> um, so uh, this would be the B phase case. <clears throat> uh, so if you have uh, specular boundary conditions, then uh, you can avoid, completely avoid suppression of the order parameter in the A phase because the A phase is chiral. All the pairs have um, angular momentum in the same direction. That angular momentum can orient normal to the surface. That means it's not suppressed if the scattering is specular. And this is a picture of random scattering by the surface or diffuse scattering, which will suppress all components of the order parameter. Uh, so the bottom line is then that we can suppress T, uh, we can get rid of the TC suppression if we have a purely specular surface. And that, that can be done by creating a superfluid helium-4 film on the surface. So we're currently measuring using NMR TC suppression as a function of surface preplating in a 200 nanometer cavity. If that's successful, that means that we can go to thinner and thinner and thinner spacings without suppressing superfluidity. So that gives us the potential to use nano positioning technology to vary the height of the cavity, uh, to the vary the number of Fermi disks, and there are predictions of Volovic uh, uh, that, that have to do with what happens when the number of Fermi disks changes by one. Um, I want to say uh, a few words about disorder, actually, um, since it may be of interest. Um, so this is the picture of uh, surface scattering that I just outlined. And clearly, uh, this is a trajectory of a quasi-particle coming in and reflecting off of the surface. Um, this doesn't make any sense uh, if the system uh, is quasi-two-dimensional. Uh, because now, uh, the energy can be written like this, where we have uh, essentially continuous momentum in the xy direction, but normal to the surface, the momentum is quantized. And we need to think about the system as minibands. J is the index of the miniband, and the total number of minibands in terms of the height of the cavity, which I've now called L for some reason, is given by, is given by this. Uh, now, there's something very clever, which is that you can make a, a transformation uh, from a non-uniform thickness of cavity, it's going to be non-uniform if one of the surfaces is rough, uh, to a perfectly smooth cavity by making a coordinate transformation of this nature, where this is the surface roughness, the roughness of this surface as a function of lateral position. And what these authors shows then is that the surface roughness then, what, once you make this coordinate transformation, you end up with an effective bulk disorder potential. And so I find this really neat. Uh, the surface roughness gives you a disorder potential that can be calculated from uh, the surface roughness 
which itself can be measured. So you can completely determine, in principle, the disorder potential in this mesoscopic, in this mesoscopic system. Uh, so some experimental evidence for that, then, is um, in this paper here. So the bottom line is, in quasi-2D, a different approach to surface scattering is required, that, uh, different from the traditional approach to understanding the effect on order parameters and so on of superfluid helium-3 under confinement. Um, so I need to finish up. Uh, so so um, I'm just going to uh, give a kind of roadmap then of where we need to go with this. Um, we're putting the superfluid, which is a topological superfluid, into uh, a confined geometry. Our chilling parameters are the size of the geometry, uh, the nature of the surface. We can apply symmetry, symmetry breaking fields. Uh, we can create structures where we have thick, thin, thick. Uh, that's a hybrid structure in which the nature of the phase then is controlled by the confinement. That means we can make controllable interfaces between superfluid and normal state. We, need in this, we can determine the equilibrium order parameter using NMR. The confinement is, expect to give us, is expected to give us a possible new order parameters. And we're also interested in surface and edge states. This makes connection with the topological superconductivity super uh, uh, community. Uh, the key problems there are to detect Majorana fermions, to detect Majorana vial excitations, to demonstrate in a topological superconductor bulk edge correspondence. The problem is, is that no topological superconductor in bulk exists in nature. Therefore, our philosophy is superfluid helium-3 is a topological superfluid with P-wave pairing. So it's a neutral topological superconductor. It's a beautiful system, and it's one uh, that we can learn a lot about and feed into topological superconductivity when, that system, when such a system is discovered. So the surface of helium-3b has dispersing Majoranas, uh, and uh, I think really uh, the, 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 the main goals are to detect the helicity of these surface states. Uh, that helicity means that on the surface of helium-3b there are ground state spin currents. We'd like to detect those. And these Majoranas are probably going to have interesting non-local responses, and could we uh, detect those? And um, the other beautiful thing about superfluid helium-3 is that the order parameter has uh, mid-gap collective excitations, so-called Anderson-Higgs modes, uh, modes of the order parameter that have frequency on the order of the gap itself. How do those collective modes of, uh, of the order parameter couple to the surface excitations? That's a really interesting question. Chiral helium-3A has got analogs with uh, the quantum Hall effect. Uh, there should be edge states. Can we detect those edge states? Uh, can, uh, there's a thermal quantum Hall effect, which it would be nice to observe. Uh, I don't have time. Just, uh, that was all like pie in the sky of the future direction of the field. Uh, th this is just a summary of some measurements that we've done because uh, we did the first experiments on superfluid helium-3 combined in such nano-engineered geometries. These references are in the abstract, so I'll skip that and I'll skip the data. Uh, so the future prospects on, of, on topological superfluid helium-3 is that it's the only established topological superconductor, in inverted commas. We can manipulate its order parameter by confinement. We can measure the order parameter by NMR. We can look for surface excitations in B, which are Majorana's, Majorana vial edge modes in helium-3, which is chiral. Um, and I'd like to finish uh, with acknowledging my collaborators. Um, uh, strong collaboration with Givet Papier's group in Cornell. Uh, James Sauls is a theorist at Northwestern who helps us a lot with understanding topological superfluidity. The collaboration with uh, Dietmar Drung and Thomas Schurig in Berlin at PTB, the German Standards Lab, is crucial for the DC squids that we need for uh, NMR. 
And we also have a broad collaboration in Europe with all the groups that have capability uh, in the micro-Kelvin range. And I'd also like to mention uh, a number of theorists with, in which, with which we are in uh, regular dialogue. So thank you very much for your time and attention. <clears throat> We've run a little bit over, but I would like to allow one, one question if there is a, a pressing one. Yes. Uh, topological server flow that is a very interesting topic. Uh, may we introduce the, some of the new physics parameter to describe the topological super fluid? You know, when we start the quantum flourishing quantum hall, we uh, use the age state. It's a topological parameter. When we start the topological insulator, we introduce the chain number yep. and the value phase. Yep. It's a new parameter. I mean, yep. says yep. when we are start the topological superfluid, maybe we want to introduce some yep. new yep. parameter. Yeah. So the classification of topological quantum matter. There's a paper by um, one of the authors is Schneider. Um, so there's that periodic table. Uh, Helium 3b and helium 3a are different entries in that periodic table. Uh, if I remember correctly, helium 3b is d3 and um, helium 3a is z2. So those are the different characteristics. Um, there, there, there is an, a, a, a bit of an analog between um, superfluid helium 3b and uh, topological insulators. Um, it has, uh, the B phase has a fully gapped uh, bulk and there are surface states in that case. Um, that analog mustn't be taken too far because um, the topology of the ins topological insulators has to do with the band structure. Uh, here it has to do with the gap of a superfluid state which is an emergent quantity. Um, and what that means then is that the symmetry of the superfluid and its topology are more uh, connected together. It's a more subtle thing. And I think he does need experiments to try to disentangle um, those effects. If that helps to answer your question. Okay, let's thank, thank uh, Professor Saunders one more time for a fascinating talk about beautiful experiments. All right, so we'll have a 20 minute coffee break outside the auditorium. We have two stations left and right, so feel free to uh, go out and enjoy the break. We'll see you in 20 minutes.